first off, I want to welcome you to our um, all, our July uh, ACA call. Uh, you know, I, I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, ACA stands for Ask Coach Anything, right? So it's really just we're going to do Q and A all day, up to an hour. Make you know really add value uh, for those who submitted things. For for those who didn't submit, you you can always put something in the box, and if I can get to it, I'll get to it in our time. Uh, we'll go up to an hour. So getting back to the ACA piece, so I never, you know, I don't think like this. So I had a couple people email me and say, hey, are you going to be talking about the Affordable Care Act? Like, is this going to be like one of a technical training? And I and I sat there and I said, man, maybe I need to rename this because you know that's not a that's not a that's a hot topic and not a positive topic for everybody today. But ACA means ask coach anything. You submit your questions. Uh, I'll, either, I'll if I can, I'll bring you on live with me for a couple minutes, right? So we can do a little back and forth. I like to do that. Uh, I've got my trusty whiteboard here. If I need to use it, the picture's worth a thousand words. We're going to do it. A couple things uh, on the other piece. There's no back end here. So what I mean by that is, there's no hey, sign up for this or go do that or anything like that. I, I'm here to help. And you know, I made my mission in in my adult life for nearly 25 years now. I'm here to help advisors be better professionals, better better people, to make more money for their families and for themselves, and to add value to all their clients. That's my mission, plain and simple, right? And I'm and I love it. I'm passionate about it, and I'm going to do this to the day I die. And my goal is that's not going to be for a long, long time. I'm just getting ready for my second half act, so to speak. Okay. Now, so with that being said, what I want to do is I'm just going to go ahead and kind of go through the order here of how the questions are positioned. Um, not everybody's going to be here. I totally understand that, and that's cool. Um, I'm still going to spend some time on their questions. I think it, I, cause they're all good questions. And uh, I'll keep you anonymous. I'll just use the first name, and um, and we'll go from there. So so uh, Michael, Michael wrote, hey, I've plateaued in my business. I would like to utilize Practice Power Academy. Good, great tool, right? Uh, how should I utilize it? Where to start? And, you know, it's a great question. I don't think he's even here at this point. Um, and and here's why. There's a lot. Of, you know, the reality is when we built it, when we built the academy, you know, we had we had two choices. We could have flowed it through like this kind of agenda, almost like a curriculum, right? Start here, do this, do that, do that. And we really kind of went back and forth because that's one way to do something. And the second way is kind of here's everything. Pick what, where are you on fire? Go do that first, right? And so my way, my coaching style is I am not a process-oriented coach. And what that means is I'm not going to uh, – it's not my agenda. It's the client's agenda. So my philosophy is here's everything. Where do you need the most help? Go do that. So, in, so, for, uh, for, so for Michael – what I'd recommend you do is the best place, one of the best places to start in Practice Power Academy is Business Plan Builder. Because two things that I absolutely certain on with advisors 90% of you either A, don't have a plan, B, will have a plan that you're not inspired by. So at minimum, go in there, do all eight modules, it'll take you some time. I'm telling you, you go through that, you're going to be focused, you're going to be excited, you're going to have, I've never had a person, we've done, Probably 5,000 business plans since we opened this up. I've never had somebody say that was a waste of time. So, so Michael, I'd say number one, you start there, and then in the e-learning series, I would start with morning ritual, daily game plan, right? So, a, let's build. Hey, what's the vision you want to create? And then tactically, well, how do I need to run my morning? How do I need to run my day? I mean, for most advisors, that's the, that's where we get sideways with things. So we want to really, really take a good advantage of that. So I think that's a great place to start. And uh, you know, we haven't really added it up recently, but last time we kind of did a you know we did the new design and we kind of looked at everything. You know, we've got about 300 hours worth of stuff. Meeting mastery and map are probably 40 hours long. The series of them, each one, right? So you know, I would challenge anybody, quite frankly, to you know get through it in a couple of years. And what you want to remember is it's 100% free. You know, there's no there's no upsell, there's no hidden door that if you don't oh you want this piece you gotta go buy it. It is my gift to the industry. We we stopped the billing on this earlier this year. I made it totally um, 
uh, free and the way I position is my gift to the industry. This industry has really afforded me a tremendous life lifestyle and, uh, and I just want to help. So uh, some people ask me if I'm the real deal. Hey, I don't need to, you know, justify that. Just go and go, it's here, it's free, like zero, no money, right? Go do that. So, Michael, hopefully that, uh, that'll give you a way to uh, kind of make things happen. Okay. Next question, uh, this is from Steve. Uh, what is the best way to introduce existing brokerage clients to a managed account or just advisor? So, so we either got transactional or dead money, and then how do we, how do we flip it over to, uh, well, you know, in some levels probably compliant, you know, being DOL compliant now. And then also from our business perspective, you know, I will say a couple things on this. And I really was thinking about this. You know, years ago, and a lot of you I'm gonna I'm gonna, you know, fathom that have been around this for a while, you know, there's there was a period of time that there was no such thing as a bad asset. There was no such thing as a bad client. In other words, if you know, even if they were not driving any revenue, it was totally non, you know, it was buy and hold, non-transactional, non-fee, quote unquote, it was okay because at some point there there's going to be a liquidity event. They're going to need money or they're going to die, right? And we're going to have to liquidate this. So there's our so from an advisor's perspective, there's hey, there's that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and and today that's the furthest thing from the truth because now that those dead assets are liabilities. In the new world, you know, when I when somebody when I said, "Hey, how much money do you have under management?" Well, I've got 125 million under under you know in assets. Are great. How much of that is, is fee based, advisory in a model being reviewed, touch based calls, and they'll say, you know, 75 million, and there's like 40 million. That's not. I said, well, okay. So what you really have here is you got 75 million of assets and 40 million of liabilities, and they go, "What are you talking about liability?" And I said, "Look." Right now, they're not getting they're not getting any, getting any revenue. The chances are they may be taking up some of your time or your team's time, right? So that's, there's money out the door, right? And God forbid they pass on, and the children look at what's in there, and they don't like what they see. They're going to get the attorney, and they're going to sue your butt. And that's the reality today. I've told all my clients that you know you're not saying you're going to like quickly. You've got to either get them in a model or graduate. So I'm going to make that compelling argument first. Now, as far as how to do it, this is where the nuances come in, okay? What you, I'll, I'll tell you what you don't do first. What you never do is make it about the math. You never sit there and say to somebody, I can save you money. You know, if you go from this transactional to this, you know, this will save you money. Because as soon as you open up that door, everything now is negotiable, and we don't want to do that. So what it really boils down to, and as much as I know there's a lot of consternation about DOL and everything like that, I will say this. It is giving everybody a reason to go blame something else, i.e. the government, Department of Labor, whatever. Hey, we now have to do this, right? I don't want to do this for you, but it has to be done. This is the law of the land now, so we've got to do this. What I have found, and, and I can say this pretty much across my you know, 75, 85 clients that I talk to on a regular basis, is by and large, people are acquiescing to it if you position it as this is something we have to do. If you leave it as a, well, you might want to consider, or this will be in your best interest, or you know, you kind of leave it where there's this wiggle room in the languaging of it, you're going to have a problem. Because there's two things you got to remember. All human beings hate change. They like it, and, the, and I say this, and look, this is going to be a global comment, which is not 100% accurate, but it's pretty close. The older you are, the less inclined you are to want to change. So if you've got clients that have been with you 20, 30 years, and it's kind of they're used to doing it one way, and now we're forced right, to change, it's nobody likes it. All right? But here's how you handle it. If you position it as this is, this is what has to happen going forward, and if you don't want to do this, you know, and I've got clients, how they, this is how we do it. You know, we'll talk to you about it now. We're not on a deadline yet. We want you to, if you don't want to do it, you know, we want you to do it now. But if there's some resistance, hey, why don't you think about it for 30 days? I'm going to come back to you. You know, we're going to have a why in the road here. And then we lay out your options. You know, look, you do this. We'd love to keep you. We'd love to work with you. We'd love to elevate what we're doing with you, right? Financial planning, being proactive. Reviews really operating in that fiduciary environment. We want to do that in your best interest. 
If you don't want that, and you don't want to compensate us for that, uh, that's your choice. Then we're going to have to ask you to kind of go here. And depending on your firm or your situation, whether you got call center, self-directed, uh, you got to transfer them out somewhere. And here's an interesting part of that. And this is where we don't talk about it as an industry, but it's really kind of the hidden lever. Because, because people don't like change. Think about this. What represents more change to a person? Paying a fee to get a higher level of service or having to go find a brand new advisor, a whole new setup and so that, which is going to be more massive in their mind? What's going to be more challenging in their mind? So what happens in a lot of cases, it's been interesting, when it really comes push to shove, like, you know, why, like are you in or are you out, right? When it comes to that moment of majority, 70, 80%, I don't have data, like pure data, but my sense of the matter is 70 or 80% of the clients when having that one in the road between not thrilled, but I, at least I know what I got here versus I go whole new game over here, it's a problem. Now, the other thing, Steve, and what you did not ask, but I want to add, and this is for everybody, there's a, there's a hidden business opportunity in all of this DOL mess. Here's the opportunity. This is a tremendous time to go to those clients that you believe have, you know, they're cheating on you with another advisor, there's some outside money, things like that. And if you can get your fees a little flexible, a little creative, right, uh, you know, kind of get outside the box a bit, it is a tremendous opportunity to say, hey, bring that here. You're going to have to, by the way, that person over at the other farm, they're probably having that same conversation with you. If you can bring it all here, we can do this with the fee, and it's actually going to save you money, and it'll be easier. The advisor to get to the client first and offer a consolidation and a creative pricing structure has a lot of power. In the last 90 days, I've had clients bring in four, five, eight, ten, twelve million dollar accounts, along with you know a ton of hundred thousand dollar accounts on this strategy. It is a tremendous opportunity and a great reason rationale to go get the money. Right? As long as you can offer them an overall better pricing structure and an overall value proposition. I'm telling you, the business is there to be had, and nobody's thinking about it because everybody's worried, everybody's worried about everything else. It, here's what I would say, and this is not directed at you, Steve, it's just kind of everybody. Ignore the noise and look for the business opportunities because they're there and they're plentiful. There's more money in motion today than I can ever remember. The baby boomers are retiring, advisors are retiring, or at worst, they're not retiring and they're just hanging out collecting a check doing jack for their clients, there's just a plethora of opportunities and, we, and we're seeing it. So, you know, you will, as, as a human being, professional, person, and, per, and a person, you will manifest, you will see what you want to see. So if your brain is all about all this mess, you are, you're going to see nothing but mess. If you think about, hey, where are the opportunities, I wonder how we can leverage this, what can be there, it now becomes an opportunity. So just be careful kind of what you're, what you're looking at. Because it's easy to get wrapped up in all the negative stuff, and what you really miss are the great opportunities. So just keep that in mind. So, so there's always uh, great entrepreneurs, and, and I know a lot of you don't think of yourself as such, and you need to start. Great entrepreneurs always look for the business opportunity in every situation. And that, in my mind, is one of the biggest business opportunities. Okay? So, um, next. How do you define your ideal client when you just start to build your book or when you have limited demographics? So this is by Katie, and let me see if Katie's here. Not yet. Okay. So to me, look, and by the way, this is like I'm gonna use, I get to use a whiteboard now, so it's cool, right? So look, when you're starting out in business, I'm gonna address this to her, and, and, and you all you all get a feed on this. Is the you know, we'd like to say, hey, we're going to have this hard minimum and we'll do that. At the end of the day, when you're starting your business, the most important currency you have are relationships. Client relationships, COIs, your network, because we're in a relationship business. Relationships are our most valuable currency. So to Katie's point, well, you know, how do you define ideal client? I'm going to give you my ideal client definition, which, by the way, is for all of you, all right? And, I'm going to, and I, I did come up with an acronym, so I'm going to tell you what this is. Hopefully, you, I hope it doesn't go backwards, all right? So I got that. 
I got that, I got that, and I got that. LPCL. That is the way we measure client relationships. So what's the L? Do I like you? Because if I don't, because if you got a client you don't like, and it's, it's one of these deals, right? They're on the phone. Your stomach turns. They're coming in for a review. Man, you just want to puke and you want to call in sick, right? Whatever it is. So number one, I don't care if you're one month in the business or 30 years in the business. Life is too short to deal with asses and idiots. Okay. So number one, they, you got to like them. And part of this like, by the way, is they respect you. They respect you as a person and they respect you as a professional. Next, simple math, money. They're profitable, so P for profitability. So they're going to, they'll, they'll drive enough economics to warrant your time. Now, starting out, your economics, you know, your economics will be at a different level, so you'll have much lower minimums. Uh, and let's face it, you're going to do certain things that are probably going to be at an economic short-term loss as you practice your craft. But a minimum for everybody, what you're, and when we talk minimums in this industry, and by the way, this is the thing I take a very big exception to, this industry has this concept about assets. Well, I have a $250,000 250, minimum or half a million dollar minimum or my firm counts a qualified household at two fifty. dollars That is absolutely irrelevant today. What's relevant to your business is, and look, if you've got, if you got $40 million of dead money, that ain't paying your mortgage. That's not going to pay your car payment. That's not going to put your kids in college. You've got to think of what do I need economically to have a client? What is the minimum amount of gross revenue that I need to make this work for me, right? And I'm not going to sit there and say it is this X or Y. I mean, for some of my clients, it's $2,000 a year. For some, it's $5,000 a year. For some of my clients, it's $25,000 a year. So again, the beauty of our space is guess what? You can have it all, all right? So probability. Next, coach. And I would put ability below there. So coachability, what does that mean? They take advice. They, they listen to you. They let, you, they let you help them, which is why we're there to begin with, right? And we've look, we've all had this. I've had this. I know a lot of you got people on the call have had this. You get a client, man, they just don't listen. It's like they're like rockheads, and, you're, and they're paying you, and you can't help them. And you're like, what? And you know, whether it's because you need to tweak a portfolio or you need to do some financial planning or their, wills are, their will and estate plans and shambles and they don't care, it's like they have to take it. You do not want to ride shotgun on a train wreck. So that's got to be one of the things. So one of the things we want to measure always is, are they going to be coachable to us? Are they going to, are they going to allow, are they going to, we, is this going to be like pulling teeth every time we got to make a recommendation or every time we got to do something? It's like a, like a big debate. Again, that's a lot of energy, right? So make sure they're coachable, right? You got to make sure they'll take advice, right? And this is the, this is the one that, I, I, I hate the word optional because I, I really don't want to say it that way, but if I had to pull one off, I'll pull this one off. Leverageable. Now, what do I mean by leverageable? They'll act as an advocate. They're open to introducing you to people that they know that need your help. They're, they're open to, that. again, in my perfect world, right, we have these four measurement pieces. And this is how, whether you're, again, 30 days in the business or 30 years in the business, you want to measure your relationship. Now, I do have clients, and, and I, I look, I deal with a lot of OCD people, right? So I do have several clients that will actually take this formula and look and go through their client list once a year and grade them. How, one to five. How much do I like you? Five being perfect, one being, you know what, we should probably get rid of you. Economics and people actually, I've got clients that actually have a scale, and they come up with this kind of, you know, in their minds, pretty sophisticated scoring system, and that's how they decide what households they want to graduate, and they do it by a scoring mechanism. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not advocating it here. I'm not saying everybody should do this, but if you if you're one of those kind of OCD types, right, and you want something that's a little bit more process driven, which is okay, here's a great scoring way: like likable, profitable, coachable, leverageable. Right? There's a formula. That's how you look at client relationships, okay? So, next, uh, from Jeff, new client agendas. I need a resource. Okay, cool. So, I know he's, a, I know who the he is because he, he's a client of mine. So, I'm just going to, you guys will all see this on the replay anyway. So, you don't need to see it while I'm here. Best place for first meeting agendas. 
and outlined is going to be Practice Power Academy, Sales Training, Meeting Mastery. There's 27 modules there. I think the first meeting starts at, at uh, session 13, 13, 14, 15, I do believe. It's probably a couple hours long. It will give you a list of questions uh, that you want to have. And by the way, and this, and he brings up a great point here. A lot of advisors have this this mishmash process around meetings. It's really bad, and it's it's not just bad because you lose opportunities. You rob people of the opportunity of you of you helping them. You just blow it. I hate to say it in any other way. And because you just kind of have this concept, and and look, you know, to me, the first meeting, and it does, and look, I can talk different meeting models, and there's there varies, there's variations, and we're not going to get into that here. But the universal on the first meeting is for all the variations. You're there to build rapport, build trust, and gain a deep understanding of that human being and what their issues are. You're not there to pitch your process. You're not there to pitch your 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 product. You're not there to pitch you know, your business, you're there 90% to interview them and get them to answer questions and get comfortable with you. Because think about this from just a layman's point of view. If we think salesmen or saleswoman, it doesn't matter, what are the characteristics? If somebody says, describe for me a salesperson, one of the key characteristics you're going to find in there, they talk a lot. They present, they pitch, right? We don't want to be that person. So we want to be, we want to have those anti-characteristics. I want to be, I want to be pleasant, respectful, caring. I want to have great empathy. I want to ask great questions. And all the questions, by the way, are in the sales training center on those, again, on those audios. And I just, because the more I can get to know them, their background, their fears, their needs, their wants, their wounds, what they're looking for, what they're seeking. I can then put a proposal together that's going to meet all their needs. And they're going to say yes to me because it's what they want. But if we're busy in that first meeting kind of slapping stuff against the wall and, oh, man, we can do this and we do that and we're great and look at our website and, and look at look at you know our planning process and all this other jazz, you're not, you, A, you're talking at them. They're, number two, they're not really listening, quite frankly, and you have no idea, no idea what their what their triggers are. And I see this every day in my work it, with some of my long-term clients. It's like, you know, okay, let's get this fixed. Um, there's too much money at, on stake. There's too, you know, it's almost like we're as an industry we're lazy. I was telling, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. We are the we are the we are the laziest profession I think I'm aware of, and I know some of you may, may may take offense to that. But let me explain what I mean. I'm not talking about how much time you spend in the office or how hard you think you work. I'm talking about lazy mentally, because we would just rather zone out on a meeting or something like that because it requires energy to be present with somebody. Yet we can have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on the line, and our brain we're checked out because we don't want to focus. That's what I mean, and that will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars of income every year to be checked out in your client meetings and in your prospect meetings. So, so for you, so basically, you know, for Jeff, just go and practice Power Academy, get those modules, and build, and you know, build an agenda builder that's yours. So people ask me, hey, why don't you just kind of create this fact finder? The problem with it is, it's everybody's going to have a different thing, right? And I have to charge a lot of money, and I don't get into that. It's not my business. But listen to the audios, listen to the questions, listen to the sequencing that I do, and build it out. This this will work. So hopefully, Jeff, that will uh, that will help you with that. All right, let's go on to Daryl. Um, what's the best way to market and develop retirement plans and investments to small business? Okay, so K you know, so we're going to be in the K business, right? So a couple things, real quick. Um, the old days, right? Uh, I guess five years ago, maybe. Um, a lot of ways, guys and gals of mine got K business was there were really two avenues, maybe three. Uh, number one, you build relationships with CPAs. They have small business people. You can kind of get in that way. Number two, you can go to every chamber of commerce event, know the man in your area, network the heck out of it, and get get to meet some business owners that way. 
or the third way is you would actually get in your car, drive downtown or wherever, and you'd like walk like they used to cold walk, right? And you know, I, look, I think everything still works. It's just that, okay, highest and best use, right? What's most effective? So I do have, I do have several clients that do operate in this space, and here's what we're doing now, kind of new. Um, first off, I think branding matters. So here's what I would say. With everything going on with ERISA laws and everything like that, I would never recommend to any, any one of my clients to dabble, dabble with K-plans. They're just too, they're just too, they're, you know, first off, the margin's like this, unless you've got a huge plan, and the only way you're going to get a huge plan is if you're an expert, right? So if you're going to play here, you got to be really careful, right? You've got to have a lot of, you know, you, you know, you, you got to, you got to have a lot of growth there. So what we like is, first off, you're going to play there, be an expert, right? And being an expert, mean you know your stuff and you can showcase it. So whether you do consulting, look over their documents, understand if they're doing, if they're operating as fiduciary for the plan, like you got to really do a lot. You know, I, I find the K business now is primarily education based. And in order to educate effectively, you've got to be the expert, right? And that means you've got to brand yourself. So again, there, I don't know where you're located, um, but look, in your neck of the woods, man, you got to be known as the K-man, or however. You know, I'm not saying that in, as like oh, let's slogan that out, but you got to like if you walk around, if you're in any social event, any business event, they know. Hey, if you got a retirement plan, you want to talk to this guy. If you're not sure you're getting a good deal, you want to talk to this guy. And the way you do that is you talk. You again, again. I don't know your model. If you're a wirehouse or independent, you talk, you write, you podcast, you blog, you video, you claim that identity. Um, I have a lot of clients in various cities, um, and I won't get into details because it's kind of confidential. That you know, we talk about you know how do we dominate? How do we dominate an area? And you know, most advisors are just trying to survive. I want my clients thinking about dominating things, right? How do we become known as the go-to person for X, whether it's doctors or small business people or this or that, right? Whatever it is, we want to – nobody's – you're never going to wake up one day and somebody's going to say, hey, Daryl, you know what? We're going we're gonna to anoint you our local 401k guru or K guru. It's not going to happen. You know, nobody like nobody anoints me. I gotta go build what I do. I gotta build my credibility. I gotta build my reputation, and that's what I've done over the last almost 25 years. You gotta do the same thing, and that's for everybody here. You know, whatever market, whatever niche, whatever you want to go do. You know, it's not just about working hard. It's about smart. It's about being you know, okay. You know, let's think about this for a second. And what are some of the innovative ways? And again, I don't. I'm not professing to know everybody's background and what kind of platform they have, independent, RIA, firm, whatever. But whatever you can do to be innovative and kind of claim a niche and area, it's critical. I mean, you know, I, I, I truly believe this in five years, if not sooner, because I'm already seeing it, you know, our business model is going to be pretty much an online model. Our business development is going to be, there will be a lot of it's going to be done on the web. A lot of it's going to be done with social media because it's already happening. You know, it, it's already happening here and in, in other industries. So I think for him, you know, for Daryl, I think what it matters is to market and develop, you got to get known as the guy. Give away your consulting. Sit with people. Add value, right? Go to a small business owner. Hey, when's the last time you had your plan audited? Well, what's that? Well, we check this, this, and this. I'll do it for free. I just want to help you. Even if you can't get the deal, they're going to be appreciative you did that. Right, and then that gets a reputation. That's because if you don't get a chance to look at those plans, you got no chance at all. Right, you got to be in it to win it. So that's what you need to do with Daryl. Hopefully that uh, that gives you a little little background on there. Let's uh, let's move on. So let's go on to uh, to Dennis. Dennis says, what have you found to be the best way to motivate yourself when feeling run down, weary, etc. So so we'll just say slump, right, from that perspective. And I think. Uh, you know, he's here, so let's grab him. Well, be careful what you wish for, Dennis, right? Let me see if I get you. If not, no big deal. Um, uh, can you hear me? Can we hear you say something? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, man, we're good. So, hey, don't don't use last names. You know, we want to be totally authentic and keep things open here. So so walk me through exactly kind of, you know, where you're at and what's going on, and, and let me give you some strategies today, now. 
Well, that's just, I mean, you get to a point sometimes where you're just doing a routine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you set your daily plans, you do some scheduling, but, you know, then you start getting a little less motivated and you start, your time's not there. You know, you're getting up a little bit later or you're, you don't have the energy level or you're not following your plan as well. And usually I see there's some sort of motivation that says, you know, I got to get this done, I want to get this done, or I'm looking right. forward to getting this done or something, you know. Right. But that sometimes wanes. Yeah. yeah, no, okay. So let me ask you some follow-up questions, and again, you can you know, answer them the way you want. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your health and energy? 1 to 10. 10 being, I, mean, I, go, I do triathlons for weekends for just fun and games. Yeah, you know, 7, you know, and there okay. I bike and bike and all that, so, you know. Okay, so you're pretty good. So you so so from so from from a physical standpoint, not an issue there. We feel pretty good. Okay, so right. then so then so then we're on the other side of the equation, which is the vision. So, what what is your vision for your business over the next three to five years? And, and let me kind of put some things around it. And you don't need to answer it in great detail, but but hear me out. A lot of times, and again, I don't know your story, but a lot of times there's two psychologies in this business, and there's two psychologies in life. And you know, and, and we talk about you know we talk about AS, okay? So A is the abundance psychology, right? Which means there's plenty of business out there. I'm gonna go get it. I'm gonna make it happen. You know, I don't need to worry about anything. And that's a by the way, th that that is this is a mindset. This is a conscious decision you make. So you got the A, and then the C is the scarcity. Like man, I'm just trying to pay my bills and and I'm struggling. And 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 look, both of those are patterns, right? And and so how do you go from S to A or you know which is the way we want to go? It really boils down to what's your obsession? What 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 is going to get you so excited about your business and your future, both personally and professionally, that you literally can't wait for the next day to start so you can go after it again? And I and that's what you really need to do now. Again, I don't know if you've been in Practice Power Academy, if you've done you know any of the, any of the uh, business planning modules, but like Module One. Ideal life and lifestyle. I mean, you you have to determine. Hey, I can have this, right? And 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 I will say this. I don't care if you've been in business five years or thirty five years. It's irrelevant. This industry has no retirement date. You know, we're not airline pilots here. We got to punch out at sixty five. You know, we could be here for a long, long time. And and here's the one thing. And and so along with the abundance, you got to think about beliefs, right? Because it's all about beliefs. The B word, right? And then we'll talk about self image. Right, self-image, SI, and then ID, internal dialogue. And I'm gonna do this a little bit different. This is really cool. I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you all something in a second. You gotta believe that your best years are still in front of you. Like man, I, whatever I've done for the last X amount of years, it was just prep and practice and getting it all ready till I'm ready to roll today. Number two, so let me ask you now, I'm gonna ask you this question directly. Do you have a set of compelling goals or a vision for yourself? That man, you really, really bought into. Do you have that? Um, mixed. And I'm going to say it's not real strong. The goals need to be better, or my individual goals need to be stronger. And that's kind of how, what I'm. What how, if you if you think about your goals, how many of them are scarcity, survival based versus abundant, ideal life based? I wouldn't say any of them are scarcity, but it's a matter of doing better than I'm doing. Right. You know. But, but better is nebulous. So how much like? And I'm serious. Like this. This is where because if it's unclear in our how we're going to frame it to ourselves, we can't create this this connection to go make things happen. The more precise you can be in in what you want to accomplish, the more power you're going to have to stay the course. And and a lot of people think this is like a willpower thing. And I used to. By the way, now I'm going to segue. This is a good question. So whoop. So I'm going to segue into this right now. I used to think that that achieving greatness or accomplishing goals was about energy, effort, stick to itness, overcoming objections, and, and they're still all true. But this is a brand, for everybody. This is a brand new concept. I've been honing this for the last several months, and I'm going to lay it to you. I'm going to lay it to you all right now. There are basically four. This look, I suck at art, so please don't comment on my boxes. I know they suck, but you'll all get this. Whenever you want to make a change, personally, professionally, here are the four areas you need to take a look at. And by the way, they're in no particular order. Number one, what do I believe? What do I believe about success? What do I believe about failure? And I just did this in Atlanta on Friday. I had a group of, I had a group of advisors. We did a one-day study group. 
And I went around the table and I asked them all this very important question. How do you define failure to yourself? And I had them, and I literally had everybody go around the room, how do you define it? And pretty much everybody except for one, which I give that person a lot of credit, said failure to me was not achieving my goals or not achieving my desired outcome. And I said, right there, the way, you, the way you're framing failure to yourself is holding you back because who wants to fail? Who wants to have that negative outcome? And look, and I was the same way. And it only was to very recently I kind of figured this out that, that would hold, if you think, and Dennis, I'm talk, I'll talk about you, I'm talking to everybody. If you really think what holds you back from getting your ultimate destiny, your ultimate goal, your ultimate whatever it is you want, it's fear. It's fear of failure. Because what happens if I try and it doesn't happen? And we have, as human beings, a built-in mechanism, like from the Stone Age, right? Like, see the saber, see the tiger over there? Don't go near the tiger. It will eat you, right? We have this fear thing. It's that flight, that fight or flight, right? That fight or flight mechanism. Well, how it manifests here is that we play it safe. We don't go for it. And the way, and the way it really manifests itself is that, oh, you know, that person, they probably have an advisor. I'm not going to talk to them. Or I got this referral. I'll call them next week. They're probably busy, right? And this is the, this is the mental game we play with ourselves that hold us back from greatness. So, so you got your beliefs. Then you got your values and rules. Okay, what's important to me? How do I measure it? Next one, huge, self-image. The man or woman in the mirror. When you look, and I'm not, that's not directing this at you precisely, but hopefully you'll get, this will add. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? And not, no BS, honesty. Are you authentic? You know, you you know, are you, are you a successful person. You care. You bring it. You add a ton of value to people. And or is it, man? I'm lucky. Boy, I'm really an imposter. Boy, if people really know how I operate it. Boy, they would never do business with me. And look, and I'm not saying that's you, but there are a lot of people that walk around thinking they're lucky, or man, I'm just lucky to be in this business, or I'm just trying to survive. And and you tell yourself that story long enough it will become a reality for you and that becomes an issue. So I got self-image, then I got ID. Now what's ID? ID is internal dialogue. What do you say for yourself? When something really good happens, oh man, I got lucky on that one. Or when something goes bad, see, I knew it was not gonna happen. See, I knew I couldn't pull that off. And all this stuff, we call it, by the way, what I call this is POS. POS stands for Personal Operating System. This is how your brain works for you, for everybody, for me. I have spent the last 90 days dissecting myself, multiple whiteboards, weekends, and I'm telling you, that you, this is where you will make a breakout, you get this straight. We have a belief shop, we have a belief workshop in, in practice power module. This is module two of the business planning process right now. This is module two of the business planning process. This is module two. This one we haven't really covered in Practice Power Academy, but I will cover it. All breakthroughs happen with massive personal development change. So you want to make more money, as we all do, hopefully. It's really about saying, I got to elevate myself as a person. When I elevate myself as a person, my business elevates. Because at the end of the day, you and everybody on this call with me, everybody, we are the product. Period. You know, we think it's our planning process and what we sell and our portfolios and all that jazz. No, 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 no. Those are way down the list here, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Primary, you. And a lot of people don't want to hear that because that scares the crap out of them, but it's true. So the question must be asked then, what do, what do I need to improve me, the product? That's what's most important. Does that make sense to you? It does, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's what it means. Like, like, you know, like I can sit there and tell you, hey, man, let's do more calls. Let's get some more meetings going. Let's do more reviews. And I'm not saying that's not part of the recipe, perhaps. But what you're gonna, you want a game changer? This is the game changer because this is what's holding everybody back. How you look at failure, how you look at fear, how you look at yourself, how you talk to yourself. You're the product, man. If there's, and if there's, and if you, when you get this aligned to where it all works the way you want it to work. It's like a switch, and I wish I, I just wish I can impart to everybody how magnificently powerful this is when you adapt it to yourselves. It's like you don't. You, it's almost like you're you're seeing things differently. You see opportunities. You see everything so clear. So 
I, I, I would, you know, and I've got some other videos on this on my YouTube channel. You can check them out. Um, but that's what I'd recommend. Like massive change. Like if you're in a pattern, get out of the pattern. Change your morning ritual, right? Go out. Maybe do it in a different location. Change it. Do things like that. And uh, and literally just go help other people. The other thing I would say about this is if you if we focus too much on ourselves, we kind of get in our own head. If we focus on helping others, we're out of our head. We're helping other people. That's also a great way to break out of a slump. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. No, thank you. Thanks for a great question, by the way. I didn't. I didn't know if I was going to get a chance to do that POS thing today, so I appreciate that. All right. I uh, got a couple more questions here. So um, Terry writes, "Hey, what's the best way to get back on track once you've been off track for a few weeks?" So let me first of all, is Terry here? Um, nope. So uh, so she's lucky, I guess. So so off track happens for a couple different reasons. Uh, number one, vacations are, you know, I love vacations, right? I love downtime. I love strategic time. I love renewal time. The down, the, the, the underbelly of that is it break a lot of times it breaks a lot of patterns, a lot of habits, right? So when we get, so when we get off of that, the best thing to do, how do we get back on track? Number one, status of our morning ritual. That, if you lock your morning ritual down, and that's why even when I'm on vacation and I go away on downtime or whatever, I may not do the same ritual I do when, like I'm here, but I'm always going to do elements of it because I want that discipline, right? It's it's almost like this, man. You know, just you, you just because you go on vacation, it's not like you're gonna, you're not going to take a shower and not brush your teeth because you're on vacation, right? There are certain commonalities you do no matter what. I believe a morning ritual is one of those commonalities. It happens no matter what. It has to happen no matter what, right? So I would say first off, how's my ritual? Because if it's crappy right now or not where it is, that's problem number one. We go fix that, right? Then once I have that fix and in a good place, then everything else should feed off it, right? My daily game plan should be there. I'm executing. I think that's really important. And then the last thing I'll, I'll comment on it is that it's a momentum thing, right? So if you're going to be out of the office for like two or three weeks or two weeks or even a week, you know, it's probably not fair to say, hey, the first day back, I'm, I'm exactly the way I was when I left. Sometimes, you know, I find for every week you're out, at least, it's usually a day or two, you kind of get things back right, and I think we've got to remember that. So morning ritual number one, we roll a daily game plan, we get back to our disciplines, right? That's very important. Second thing is vacations tend to do another thing to us. We tend to have a little fun, right? We have some more. We have some cocktails. We eat some food we shouldn't eat. Oh, dessert? Yeah, let's go for it, right? No problem. And so we also kind of compromise our energy level sometimes, and that will definitely add some, you know, it will definitely exacerbate a situation. If that, so you want to kind of get, you know, so you want to get back on your health program, your nutrition program, get back to your morning ritual, and then that, that kind of flips it around. So hopefully that helps her. A uh, couple more questions, then we'll kind of wrap up, right? Like I said, I got no back end, no no sales pitch or anything today. Um, so uh, Preston writes, um, how do other advisors tier their planning fees? I .e. planning fee of five five or ten k or ten thousand plus bonuses, net worth, scope of plan. Oh man, all great questions, and I wish I can sit there and say here's how to do it, but it's literally all over the board, and I think it'll always be because I I think people will do things that they're comfortable with. Um, somebody early this morning sent me a Wall Street Journal article, and uh, you can go find. By the way, y'all can go find it. I'm sure you, you probably most of you have access to it, and it talks about how you know technology is, is really disrupting you know our industry, and they were talking about how some advisors are like we're in this fee now. We're in this kind of we're starting to see compression now, and it, and I think it's going to be a real bow wave over the next several quarters. And I was I was looking at uh, one one uh, independent shop. Um, they reduced their their fees on five million and plus to twelve. Listen to this: twelve point five basis points on five million plus, not a hundred twenty five, twelve point five basis points, and that's pure on asset management. I and mean, that's like like wow, right? And even I was like, I looked at it twice to make sure I saw it the right way, and no, it was it was twelve point five bips. Um, that's probably the extreme right now. Um, so here's what I'd say. Whatever, your, whatever the fee you have now, guarantee you in 24 to 36 months, it will be less than it is now. And some of you who are my clients who are here, um, you know, we've had this conversation of, hey, if, if the wind's blowing a certain way, 
let's not be let's not be the last boat to turn into the wind. Let's be like one of the first boats to turn into the wind and go with the wind, right? So so what I would say to Preston is I think you're going to see a couple different models right now. I think you're going to always see the straight AUM model, which is here's you know here we run money, we do planning as part of it. You pay a point, 75 bips, 50 bips, whatever. You get all the goodies. That model I think will always be there. The second model is going to be is going to be more of a, a dual model where there'll be, to Preston's note, a, a a planning fee, retainer, consulting fee, call it what you want, which will be flat. Most of what I see now, I've got clients charging anywhere from 2,500. Uh, annually for that, I do have a client because of super high net worth situations. Uh, we charge fifty thousand dollars purely for planning fees, not including asset management fees. Okay, and so that's what I'm saying. It's literally this wide, right? Um, and then you'll have AUM fees on top, and they'll be obviously they'll be reduced somewhat versus the first model because we have the planning model. That middle model, I think, is the safest model for the following reason. You, you can tranche out your AUM fees versus your planning fees. The AUM fees, this, look, the discount brokers, the Schwab's, TDs of the world, Betterment, the Robos, they're going to play, this is going to be compression here, big time. The, the planning consulting fees, or, or some of my clients are now internally calling it the relationship fee. That will, that will be a lot, that will be a, a lot uh, safer and protected because of the value adds there. So I think you'll see that. Now, as far as the planning fee goes, you know, there are some interesting things. So I said it's, you know, this 25 to 5, 50,000. Uh, 50, you know, how do you arrive at that, right? And so FPA, uh, Financial Planning Association, says that the last study that I saw was most households would consider a 1% to 2% one to two percent of household income. I don't know if it's, it's AGI or gross. Again, so I'm not going to quote that. Would they would consider that to be a reasonable planning fee to have a proactive financial planner consultant involved? That's purely for the planning aspect. So one to two percent of gross or AGI. I'm not sure which one. Okay, so you, so you can ballpark it there. Is kind of how do we set that fee? Um, I do have clients that will do it on that. Uh, literally, we'll we'll have a form of say, let's look at your tax return. I charge one percent. We, I do. I got a guy in California. He does one one, one percent of household income for planning, consulting, uh, you know, everything like that. One percent to run the money. Two separate fees. One one. Very lucrative business. Gets a lot of clients via referral. It's a really neat thing, right? Um, I've had clients look at net worth, right? Because he said about net worth. Um, the problem with net worth is how accurate is it? You're going to go to Zillow every every year and kind of get a feel for that, right? How do you value their cars, their art collections, right? I mean, so so as as interesting as it is, it's highly problematic. Where off a tax return, hey, this is the number, right? This is what gets reported to the government. So I think there'll be I think people try to figure out a net worth calculus to arrive at a planning fee. I really think you're going to see the the revenue, the household revenue or income drive some planning fees. With a with a with the AUM fees coming down that way, so you know I just think that's our space. I mean we're I'm seeing it now. I mean I've got clients we're you know we're bringing business in uh, four or five six seven million dollar accounts, 50 basis points, um, and we're getting the business. So you know it's going to be very interesting in the next couple, next couple of years. Um, what this going and we're seeing it more by the way is in the high net worth space. So the million plus that's going to be this is going to be the bloodshed here soon is in there right because that because most people that's highly coveted business the um the half a million dollar i'll call them mom and pop middle and middle america and i say that respectfully i i think because they're not as nearly highly coveted i think there's a little bit more room to run with that a little bit um so you won't see it but again on this side here so, but mom and pop middle america you can't get a huge planning fee right so again each marketplace kind of has their kind of thing right now that uh, you need to be aware of. So there was one question that uh, that Sandy dropped. So let me uh, let me see if I can answer it for her. Uh, client has a million dollars at another brokerage, about half a million with me. I think he's paying one percent at the firm at at the other firm. How should I proceed in getting them uh, getting the other money to me? What fee to charge? Currently he's on commission with me. So um, I think the best way to do that, at least I have found through working with other clients, is to offer him. 
Uh, you know, the word second opinion review, by the way, which I know our industry throws out there, like, okay, you know, here for everybody, right? And like, people know what that means, right? They don't. Is say, look, I, I want to do an analysis for you. And here's the analysis I want to do for you. I want to do an analysis on your holdings versus your risk tolerance. I want to do analysis for you on your fees versus what I think they should be. And I'm going to give you that analysis. And I'm not going to charge you for it. And you could do one of three things. You could ignore it, fine. You can take it back to your other advisor and, and demand they do these things for you, which is tweak the portfolio and lower your fee to this, right? Or if you don't want to do those two things and like to talk to me about managing that, A, we'll do a much better job for you, and B, I'll save you money. And that's exactly what it has to sound like coming out of your mouth. We can do a superior job for you, and we can save you money. And then if you want to put some gap, and I'll, I'll play the game here real quick. Um, and look, I don't have my, I'm not going to get whip my calculator out. So for you math OCD people, bear with me. So let's just say, uh, Sandy, for sake of argument, we can save them hypothetically 25 basis points. So on a million dollars, that's $2,500 $2, a year times 10 years is $25,000. You want to put 6 or 7% market on that, extrapolate through. You're going to have a number, it may be 75,000, 80,000, 100, I'd get on it. So one of you all can figure that out and let me know what that number is. And here's the, and this is for everybody, this is the magic of this whole DOL thing, bringing money in from out from competitors. Once you do that analysis, then you say to them, by the way, so if you decide, so if you decide to stay at your current advisor, it's going to cost you 75, 85,000 dollars minimally over the next 10 years to do that. Is that going to be okay with you? Is that is that relationship worth it to you? And here's the magic on that. I was talking to somebody about this this morning. It was like a, like this like moment of clarity for me. People have to justify leaving an advisor to come with you. It's I'm I'm here. I like you. It kind of sounds okay, but I got just fired, right? We flip the switch now to. By showing them the math, assuming we can have the math on our side, by showing them the math, they now have to justify staying there because now it's an $85,000 decision, a $75,000 decision. It flips, the, it flips it on its head, and now they got to justify staying, not coming with you. It's been a brilliant strategy we've used, and that's where we're getting these five and six and eight million dollar deals coming in because we're showing, we're showing the client the math in their other scenario, and 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 look, when we were talking seven, eight, nine, a quick story. We took a six. We took. A, I'm not going to get into firms because I know some of you are here from those firms, and so we're not going to go play that game. Um, I just had a client. We took six million dollars out from a very well-known firm. It was priced at that firm at one point six million, so 60k, right? We priced it at 50 bips. Could we run the money in house, right? So so right there, you guys can do the math. We showed it to them over 10 years with six percent market. And, he, and we slid, and, and what we did, and, and you know, my client did this. So this is them, not me. I'm not in the room. I'm not on the call or anything like that. You know, it, you really like your X Y Z relationship that much that you're willing to spend another two hundred thousand dollars on it over the next decade or two fifty, whatever the math was. And that blows people. You know, if you, you know, think about that. You're if you're like, wow, you know, I mean, so if I stay here, it's going to cost me this much. If I come with you, I can save that much. So in their mind. It's almost like a half a million dollar differential the way they think about it. Cost save, right? That's what human beings evaluate. So it's been a very, very powerful strategy. So Sandy, that's how I'd go about it. Offer the analysis, see if you get the math on your side, and the worst case scenario, you'll let them make an educated decision. And that's the best way to go about doing it. Okay? Um, hey, that's all, that's what I got today. Anybody have any final thoughts, questions, comments, feedback? I'd love to have it. Love to do another one of these in, in August. If you guys thought this was – so just in the box, if you wouldn't mind real quick, if you thought this was cool, worthwhile, let's do this again next month, hey, let me know. I'd like to – you know, I want, I'm want. i here to help everybody. No strings. Like I said, I got no – there's no uh, sign up here, pitch, or anything crazy like that. Uh, we, will, we will definitely do another one of these in August. I don't know when. It will definitely be on a Thursday because it's the only time I have to do them, probably around the same time. So probably think like third or fourth week of August. Um, we'll put it, we'll push it out via email to everybody uh, once we set it up. And this replay will be on the Coach 
Joe Lucas, L-U-K-A-C-S, channel on YouTube, probably in the next 24 hours, okay? Um, everybody said thank you, do this monthly. Michael, thank you so much for your, man, thank you, thank you. Love to be here. Um, yeah, it's nice to hear everybody's questions. And yeah, look, everybody, our industry, we all have same challenges, man. It's all the same, maybe a little bit different spin here and there, but it's all the same. So yeah, I love, look, look so I'll, I will definitely commit to do another one. Sandy, thank you for being here. Hey, I love doing this. So this is a passion of mine. I appreciate you all being here because you're busy people, and I thank you for the hour. I, I appreciate that. And um, and with that being said, you all have a great week, great couple weeks, great weekend. Enjoy. And uh, I will be back here some point in the next three or four weeks, and we'll do this again, okay? Thanks a lot. Be well. God bless.